Tonight on CBC Vancouver News. Calls on BC Solicitor General to make a quick decision on Surrey's proposed municipal police force. Couldn't save her, but if I can save one person, she would be proud of me. A BC mother's plea for more overdose prevention sites after the death of her daughter. They have to be somewhere else to get food. Where are the endangered orcas? The race to tag Chinook salmon as a way to track southern resident killer whales. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening. Thanks for joining us. There are calls tonight for BC Solicitor General to move quickly to approve Surrey's proposed municipal police force. But as Eva Uguensenge reports, another group is also gaining traction in its hope to keep the RCMP. Crime scenes like this have become all too common in Surrey. And as the debate of a municipal police force polarizes residents, these Sikh and Hindu leaders say the province needs to fast track the transition. Executives from seven temples representing large institutions within the South Asian community say their community is disproportionately affected by gang violence. Our congregation got, got hurt. Our devotee got hurt. So that's not a critical issue. It's a common issue for every region of Surrey. The religious leaders say a Surrey police force has widespread community support. Thank you, sir. Meanwhile, at Surrey City Hall today, Keep the RCMP and Surrey supporters say their petition against the plan has gathered more than 8,000 signatures. Ivan Scott, whose son is an RCMP officer, believes the plan disrespects the Mounties. You have a police force that is absolutely professional, that has been underfunded for years, has not been uh, had the, the number of people that are required here because we've had an increase in population here of I think it's about 10,000 a year for years now. Other supporters feel there's been too much secrecy around the mayor's transition plan. The RCMP have done a great job and uh, Mr. McCallum hasn't been really truthful on the cost and I think you know it's going to add a lot to the taxpayers. Mayor McCallum wasn't available to comment on the budget for his plan, but the religious executives believe the additional cost for a city police force is well worth it. If it's only exceeding by 10 person, it's not too much. And uh, if we compare how much per capita all cities are investing on their citizens, so Surrey is on the lowest numbers. The minister answered the letter from the temples saying while the plan provides a sound concept for a policing model, there are several elements that require more detail prior to evaluation. The province received Surrey's proposal last month. There is no timetable as to when a final decision will be made. Eva Yuguensenj, CBC News, Surrey. Well-known BC gang member Jared Bacon is behind bars once again tonight. He had been convicted of conspiracy to traffic cocaine back in 2012 and later given statutory release. But now that has been revoked. CBC Vancouver News at 11 host Dan Burrett joins us with more. Dan, why is Bacon back in custody? Drugs, Anita, at least that's part of it. Jared Bacon was let out of prison last June. Parole board documents say Bacon tested positive for cocaine in December, violating his statutory release conditions. Even before that, though, his caseworkers had doubts about his sobriety, saying instead of asking for help, he tried to hide his drug use. The documents also note Bacon missed a urine test claiming he was the victim of a hit and run. Bacon admitted to using cocaine twice to manage what he called a buildup of stressful situations, and he asked to go to a detox center. But the board wrote that Bacon's case management team believes he was not truly motivated by a recognition that he had a drug problem. It also detailed his lengthy criminal history, which we know about, his ties to the Red Scorpions and the Bacon Brothers group. The board says no supervision program can properly safeguard society against the risk he represents. So, Bacon is back in prison. As you mentioned, he was actually given statutory release early in February 2017 because of a clerical error. But he broke his conditions again back then, was hauled back into a maximum security prison until last June. Anita. Dan Burt, live for us tonight. Thank you, Dan. More than 20 people are out of their homes tonight after three fires in just 24 hours sent Surrey crews scrambling across the city. Flames leveled one home and jumped to an adjacent house overnight near King George and 58th Avenue, displacing both families. No one was injured. Twelve other people are unable to return home after fire forced a townhouse roof to collapse yesterday morning in the Guilford neighborhood. 
one person went to hospital for smoke inhalation. An abandoned building in the Cloverdale neighborhood also burned this morning in a separate fire. A lawsuit alleging a former RCMP spokesperson sexually harassed a civilian employee has been settled out of court. The suit against former inspector Tim Shields was scheduled to go to trial today, but court documents show both parties have agreed to dismiss the action. The RCMP says the terms of the settlement are confidential. Shields had previously denied the allegations and they've never been proven in court. A separate harassment lawsuit against Shields was also settled in 2017. A BC mom is calling for more overdose prevention sites after the death of her daughter. As Joel Ballard reports, she says action is needed today to prevent future deaths. I describe her as a loving, um, caring, compassionate person. Sandra Welton says her daughter Megan always dreamed of being a police officer. But on a trip to Vernon at the end of May, that all ended. Megan took cocaine laced with fentanyl and cold medicine. She was found unconscious on the ground. With her, an unused naloxone kit. That's when Welton received a call from the police. When she was using um, prior, you know, as a mother, every day when your phone rang, you were just sick to your stomach thinking this is the call. Welton believes if more communities across BC, like Vernon, had overdose prevention sites, Megan would still be alive. They need to get the safe injection site. I mean, they need to get it open because then if people go there, um, they will be doing the drugs safely with support around them. I mean, Megan had a naloxone kit in her backpack, but you can't give it to yourself when you're unconscious. A site is slated to open in Vernon this summer, although the process hasn't been smooth. Receiving backlash from residents and council members concerned about its effect on property values and crime rates. But experts say they're one of the measures responsible for preventing another 4,700 deaths over a year and a half period. It's a non-judgmental environment and we know that that's what we need for people to connect. To connect with health services, to connect with social supports they need and perhaps at some point to be able to be on that, to have that ability to enter into recovery. The province has experienced pushback from other communities like Maple Ridge and Nanaimo over the sites. But Henry says that creates a dangerous environment. Not coming together and having a place that's safe gives the message that the people aren't safe to talk about their drug use. And so they're more likely to do it alone, to be at home. And that's when we know that people are dying. Since an overdose emergency was announced in BC, the number of prevention sites have grown from 1 to 33. But both Henry and Welton say more are needed. As Welton deals with her own grief, she hopes her call for action will spare other mothers from the same pain. I couldn't save her, but if I can save one person, she would be proud of me. Joel Ballard, CBC News, Vancouver. Around 3,000 forestry workers have walked off the job today in coastal BC over a new contract. A strike comes after negotiations between Western Forest Products and the United Steelworkers went sideways, unable to come to an agreement. The union says almost 99% of its members voted to strike. Frustrated, their proposals haven't been taken seriously. WFP hasn't stepped forward with anything that's near fair. They're on the concession train and it goes from our pension, our seniority, our holiday pay, our hours of work. It's across the board. Western Forest Products says it is disappointed with the strike action, adding the union has refused mediation. Well, a group of hikers who got lost in the central Okanagan for 25 hours over the long weekend is now safe. The hikers planned to drive out to Postal Lake, but they ended up lost on a forestry road without cell phone service. To make matters worse, they couldn't find their car after their dog ran into the bush. Eventually, they hiked to an area with some cell reception and rescuers started a search based on a ping of one of their phones. Aside from several mosquito bites, all are said to be okay. A well, commuting nightmare for drivers and not much better for people living along part of a major thoroughfare in Vancouver. As Tina Lovegreen reports, construction means a two-month closure along the heavily used 12th Avenue. This will be the reality for residents along East 12th Avenue for the next two months. 
crews began replacing 100-year-old pipes under the street. In March, we had two uh, water main breaks, very severe ones, that we had to go in and do some emergency repair. The city says to do the work quickly and safely, it needs to shut down the street. So East 12th Avenue between Kingsway and Fraser is completely closed, and it has meant snarling traffic. It normally is very busy on the 12th Avenue because it's leading to the highway. But now, more busy because uh, loss of a uh, turn away. The bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic has led to some desperate behavior from drivers who don't want to sit and wait. While I was uh, waiting and coming uh, north, there was a couple of people who did U-turns. and I don't know where they're going to go, but I suppose they just get fed up. I live about two blocks down here and usually there's not much traffic. People avoid coming on the bike road unless they have to go. They live there and they have to park. There's actually um, been a lot more traffic cars coming up my street. The work began today and will likely go until the end of August. And despite the noise and the traffic disruptions, the city says the work is necessary. Very important. It's not just to get water to these residents, but it's also a, a distribution pipe that goes much beyond Fraser and Kingsway. The city says it takes time for drivers to adjust to road closures. Usually it takes about a week to settle down, and then people know and they take alternate routes, and it's, it's, it gets a lot better. Drivers are being asked to slow down or choose a different route. Tina Lovegreen, CBC News, Vancouver. Sketches of two suspects accused in a violent Coquitlam home invasion have been released. Coquitlam RCMP are hoping someone will remember hearing or seeing something unusual on February 9th of last year. Police were called to Poirier Street near Winslow just before 8.30 p.m. that night. One suspect is described as a South Asian man in his 20s or 30s with short, dark brown hair and a well-defined beard. The other, a white man in his 40s or 50s with light green or blue eyes, a shorter, stockier build. Both were wearing high visibility vests or jackets. There was also a third suspect, but there is no sketch of him. For full details, you can go online to cbc.ca slash bc. A proposed national park reserve in the South Okanagan and Similkameen is one step closer to reality tonight. This isn't about, you know, just tomorrow. This is about the next hundred years, maybe the next thousand years, um, so that future generations can enjoy this land just the way people are enjoying it today. A memorandum of understanding has been signed between First Nations and the federal and provincial governments. But the Minister of Parks says an official start is at least two years away because of what's been described as a complex combination of land ownership in the area. Well, after a beautiful and very hot Canada Day, uh, today was a little bit of a disappointment to many, Brett. You can almost say it's like nearly the exact opposite. We went from beautiful sun, lots of warm temperatures, to suddenly rain first thing this morning, and then it's just been cloudy. And I mean, I'm standing outside of our studio right now, and I'll be honest, I'm a little envious of Anita inside. I feel like that would be a nice, warmer place to be. Not to say that it's cold, of course, but we do have a lot of cloud in the sky, and I wanted to show you a current look right now at our satellite and radar across the region, because you're going to notice that on here, we don't really see a lot of green that would indicate rain, but we do see a lot of gray, which was cloud cover, and that big swath of green that you're seeing there that was the rain that fell very first thing in the morning now the question everyone has is there going to be more rain as we get into the week and the answer is probably not it's actually just going to be remaining a little bit cloudy and a little bit cooler current temperatures right now across uh, much of lower vancouver and i mean much of the lower mainland rather into the upper teens low 20s which is pretty well normal for this time of year and our overnight lows are going to be following a trend going down to anywhere between say 14 and 15 degrees but that said tomorrow is at least going to be a pretty seasonal day we're looking at daytime highs right around 20 degrees all across the region but keep in mind as i said it is going to be a little bit more cloudy than not so you don't necessarily need to worry about those sunglasses uh but just get out there and kind of enjoy it while you can and the rest of the week well i'll give you more on those details when i come back and i can hear that wind on your microphone brent too <laughs> yeah <laughs> thanks very much you're welcome well, a successful pilot project providing gymnastics for seniors is set to expand in this province. The government is giving $150,000 to the Delta Gymnastics Society to help start the program in other cities.
Since going for my exercises, where the focus is on core strength, I can stand up tall and breathe so well, walk distances, and how I can bend over and move and stretch. The class is called Seniors Can Move and is the first of its kind in BC, designed to help with fitness and balance and help seniors avoid falls. But it's also about accounting for their mental health. But what I think is equally important in any senior's plan and any senior's idea is to live well, to create opportunities to live well in communities, to live well together, to build new networks, which is hard enough to do often for many of us uh, in our 40s and 50s, but needs to continue in our 70s and 80s, even more so, even more dramatically. Registration for classes is free, and there will also be nurses and physiotherapists available for specialized consultations. Now, if you want to go more in-depth on our stories and for online exclusives, you can go to cbc.ca slash bc. You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. Find us by searching CBC Vancouver. And of course, download our free mobile app, CBC Gem. And on that app, you can watch this newscast and all of our programs streaming live and on demand. No, uh, with Vladimir's election, we're going to see uh, even more positive steps. Justin Trudeau met for the first time today with Ukraine's new president. So how will their relationship influence the country's political reform? That's next. Well, I hope you all had a great Canada Day and long weekend. We wanted to find out from you, our viewers, what it means to be Canadian. So our Deborah Goebel went to Deer Lake Park in Burnaby to find out. Whether hatched here or not, these guys are most definitely Canadian. Canada is a really welcoming country because um, they are very tolerant with immigrants. But try and pin down what exactly Canadian means and it's not quite so straightforward. Canadian flag is in my heart. The history books tell us 152 years ago, on July 1st, 1867, the British North Americas Act created the Dominion of Canada. But every single Canadian has their own unique cultural history. We have Scottish, we have a little bit of Irish, and then on my mom's side is German-Austrian. India. China, Guangzhou, English, Irish, Scottish. Some go a long way back. It's been this land for thousands of years. It has to be for thousands of years. The concept of Canada and nationalism, just a passing moment. Others are brand new. I became a citizen last year. So how to define something that seems kind of undefinable? It's okay. Sorry, That's, sorry. That, no, it's okay. Yeah, yeah, it's polite. Until we're not. Although we do seem to have a better reputation internationally than our neighbors to the south. Canadian is more peaceful than American. Still, we don't like to brag. What do you like about being Canadian? Um, Although a little humble bragging slash pride is okay. We are a, a married couple. Uh, two women uh, living almost anywhere else would have problems. But uh, in Canada, um, 50 years ago, we started to change the world. And we do have a reputation for being funny. What did the man say that lost the whole left side of his body? I don't know. I'm all right. <laughs> Although we can spew with the best of them. My favorite Canadian word is ginch. Because <laughs> underwear? Yeah. And I love maple syrup and poutines, right? Those are all Canadian. So we are no one culture. Canadian, more than 30 years. Yeah. Where yeah. were you born? We were born in Vietnam, but uh, we are Chinese origin. We share no one trait. Good place to work, good place to live, good place to uh, raise a family. We are no one thing. We're just unique. But we are Canadian. And you breathe in that air and you're like, ah, I'm home. And that is worth celebrating. Deborah Goebel, CBC News, Burnaby. Stay with us and we will have the results of a CBC poll on immigration coming up in just a few moments.
new poll conducted by CBC finds the vast majority of Canadians see themselves as generous and tolerant. But when it comes to immigration, that's not necessarily true. Canadians agree this is and should remain a welcoming country. But when it comes down to exactly who should be welcome, things get a little more uncertain. Our Cameron McIntosh has more. Ooh, I can take my car. Cool. Three years in Canada. His kids are thriving in English, but Alamayu Bayena still struggles with it. Yet he feels welcome. Are you taking care? Yes, good, good. In the 90s, he fled Ethiopia and lived in a refugee camp in Sudan for 25 years before coming here. It surprises him the poll suggests a majority of Canadians don't support having more refugees here. We're just having a bit of a technical glitch there. We will try to get back to that story later in the show. Now, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau met with the new president of Ukraine today in Toronto. Canada has given hundreds of millions of dollars in assistance to the country. As the CBC's Mike Crawley reports, now Ottawa wants to tighten economic and military ties. It's Justin Trudeau's first ever meeting with Ukraine's new president. Before winning the election this spring, Vladimir Zelensky was an actor and comedian famous for starring in a political satire show, playing the role of Ukraine's president. Zelensky took more than 70 percent of the vote by campaigning against the elites who've run Ukraine for years. His victory is boosting Canadian hopes that Ukraine's democratic reforms are for real. I know uh, with Vladimir's election, we're going to see uh, even more positive steps. Canada is heavily involved in Ukraine through training its defense forces and sending election monitors to the country. But corruption and human rights abuses remain a problem. Over the past five years, Ottawa's spending on assistance to Ukraine has totaled some $700 million. Trudeau was asked if it's been money well spent. We recognize there continue to be uh, tremendous challenges. Uh, on, uh, on the path towards uh, full reforms, but we uh, recognize that many of those challenges are also, also external, uh, with Russia determined to interfere. Your reform agenda is impressive and it's very ambitious. There is still a lot to do. Among the new president's ambitions, getting both NATO and European Union membership. I'm very pleased to be surrounded by friends who sincerely care for Ukraine. Zelensky is trying to encourage Canadians of Ukrainian heritage to invest in the country and dangling an offer of dual citizenship. Mike Crawley, CBC News, Toronto. While well, starting this month, e-books and e-audio books could get tougher to borrow. As Deanna Sumanak johnson explains, libraries are battling publishers over access and cost. A busy mom and book club member, Andrea Querido, often borrows e-books from her local library. I love the library and the library experience, um, but I love the e-book too, the ease of download. What's not so convenient? The lengthy wait. License agreements with publishers allow only one borrower at a time to read a copy. Oh, 135 days. That wait is about to get longer. Hachette Book Group, the publisher of popular books like Donna Tartt's The Goldfinch, is changing how it licenses to libraries. The initial acquisition will be cheaper, but each license will have to be repurchased every two years. I would say I was dismayed. After a period of time, we no longer own it. That means if we want to maintain collections going back, that we have to repurchase it. The company told CBC News, with a changing digital marketplace, we feel that this business model better supports our entire publishing, library and book selling ecosystem. Indeed, the other big five publishers have already moved to similar models. E-books are already more expensive for libraries to buy than physical books. There is some logic to this. E-books are more durable than physical books, which get worn out or lost after a number of years and have to be repurchased. But library associations say combining that higher cost with time-limited licenses 
will make it harder to meet the rising demand of borrowers. So customers may not get the material as fast as we would like to get it into their hands because we aren't able to purchase as many copies as we'd like to. Andrea Quirido worries it will hurt the library users who need e-books the most. If I have the means to buy these books, no problem. But if I'm stuck at home, if I'm recovering from surgery, if I'm on short-term disability and I, you know, that's my only access, I'm waiting and I'm, I'm kind of spinning my wheels a bit. So. Until then, borrowing an e-book may not require a trip to the library, but it will likely retain that old tradition, waiting and waiting while someone else finishes the book. Deanna Sumanak johnson CBC News, Brampton, Ontario. When you've got youngsters, you better go where there's food in the cupboard. A lack of food is forcing endangered southern resident killer whales to look elsewhere. Coming up, how scientists are tracking them. Here are some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News. 
Urgent calls on BC's Solicitor General to approve Surrey's proposed transition to a municipal police force. Leaders of six Sikh temples and the largest Hindu temple say they're concerned a decision on the matter will come too late. At the same time, a campaign to keep the RCMP has gathered 8,000 signatures. As a mother, every day when your phone rang, you were just sick to your stomach thinking this is the call. A BC mom wants more overdose prevention sites after the recent death of her daughter. Sandra Welton believes her 28-year-old would still be alive today had she had access to an expert for help. Well, it's whale watching season here in BC, but the endangered southern residents haven't been seen in their usual feeding grounds. With only 76 left in the wild, scientists on both sides of the border are worried the mammals aren't finding enough to eat. Briar Stewart got an up-close look at what's happening and what's being done to change it all. If you spotted the zephyr trawling off the coast of Washington state, you might think this is one of the many fishing vessels in the area. It's going to be enough for five hooks. But this is not your ordinary fishing trip. There you go. Get a good fight. It's a pretty fish. This must get hard to do if it's very like rough conditions, right? And yeah. they're rocking all over the place. Right. It gets tricky when the weather gets rougher. It's a really, really nice calm day for surgery today. Salmon surgery, that is. This team of U.S. government scientists is tagging Chinook, but this is not just about the salmon. That's because the salmon are the main prey for the endangered southern resident killer whales. These orcas only hunt for fish. Certainly there's been a tremendous interest in the United States and in, in Canada as well in uh, the plight of the southern resident killer whales. And I think it really has raised awareness of what might be happening out in the ocean. On board the boat, once the salmon are caught, they're put in a mixture of clove oil and water, which acts as an anesthetic. They're then cut open. An acoustic tag is inserted into their abdomen. Afterwards, they're stitched back up and then moved in to the recovery unit, basically a cooler with ocean water. You can see he's already waking up. It'll just be another minute or so and he'll be upright and, and looking feisty and then we'll let him recover a little bit longer and, and release him. The tags communicate with receivers that have been placed in the ocean. 560. This crew is hoping to tag 300 juvenile Chinook. And similar work is going on off the coast of Vancouver Island, where researchers with the University of British Columbia are tagging 100 adult salmon. It's all part of an effort to track the dwindling populations. If we understand the movement of the prey and behavior of the prey, we can understand more about what the killer whales have to do in order to find those prey and where they might be going and spending their time. A pod of southern residents was spotted near Tofino, B.C. at the end of May, and scientists were overjoyed when a new calf was swimming alongside them. And just last year, another image caused dismay. This mother carried around her dead calf for 17 days in an apparent act of grief. They're normally here throughout June, but they aren't around this year. Wow, aren't these guys beautiful? So, so it's the transient killer whales that have been delighting tourists in the waters between Vancouver and Victoria. They're a different type of orca. What a nice big line of whales. They're thriving because unlike the resident orcas, oh, 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 oh group of them, oh. they will happily munch on one of the many seals in the area. By now, I am quite sure that they have had something to eat. Marine naturalist Joan Lopez explains to those on board this whale watching boat why they're not likely to see the endangered orcas this time of year. I usually tell them that they just haven't been seen in the area for a long time and we believe that is because there currently aren't enough Chinook salmon returning to the river area so they have to be somewhere else to get food. If it's got kids to feed, when you've got youngsters, you better go where there's food in the cupboard. <coughs> Because there have been so few sightings of them, it's meant that researchers who've been tracking the southern residents for years had to delay their studies this season. So 
So the dog is at the front of the boat? Deborah Giles has spent the last 10 summers in a boat on the Salish Sea. She's part of a team that has trained dogs to sniff out, well, whale poop. And she recalls one of her best finds. And it was just a beautiful sample, huge and fatty rich. It was gorgeous. Not too, many people, to not too many people describe people samples that way, but <laughs> That's true. I get that you're passionate but, about but it. But after you know the kind of information that you can get from a sample like that, it's like gold. It really is like gold. She and a team analyzed the fecal samples to learn about the whale's health. They can tell whether they were pregnant and if they're getting proper nutrition. The whales are in a famine and deeper famine. These whales are not getting enough to eat at any time in the year. This spring, the federal government put in place more restrictions to limit commercial and recreational fishing in B.C. More than 100 gathered to protest, calling the move political. But Giles completely uh, disagrees. I've heard things like, well, they're eating our fish. And my reply to them is, no, actually, technically, we're eating their fish. Hmm. They were here first. They evolved hundreds of thousands of years ago to eat Chinook salmon. We're the ones that are eating their fish. Back on the Zephyr, scientists are hoping the tagging projects give them a sense of the Chinook's behavior, how deep they travel and where they go. They hope the data can help shape future policy when it comes to protecting the Chinook. I think some populations of, of uh, salmon are really at risk. I do worry, you know, 20 years from now, what populations will still be around and which ones won't. There he goes. And he worries what the Chinook's fate will mean for the orcas whose survival depends on them. Briar Stewart, CBC News, off the coast of Washington State. And just one more thing to add to this story. We spoke to one scientist who says the southern residents could be in California. Fishermen there are reporting a boom in Chinook and where the salmon go, the whales often follow. You can learn more about the dangers facing British Columbia's orca population by listening to CBC's upcoming original podcast, Killers, J-Pod on the Brink. CBC Radio 1's Gloria Makarenko looks at the climate change, pollution and politics behind the pod's declining numbers. That's available online, cbc.ca slash podcasts starting on July 18th. Well, you're looking at a live shot on this Tuesday evening. It uh, is noticeably cooler today and the rest of the week may be a bit of a mixed bag. Brett has the full forecast next.
Well, quite the memorable moment in the skies above parts of Chile and Argentina today. Millions of people were able to see the moon completely block out the sun. In northern Chile, tourists and locals gazed up as the solar eclipse slowly darkened the sky. Scientists gathered in an observatory in the region to witness the spectacle. They were most interested in studying the corona, which is the outermost part of the sun's atmosphere that can only be seen during a total solar eclipse. And this is the first one that's happened since 2017. Amazing. And uh, I was in northern Chile earlier and, and in the Atacama Desert and yeah. got to see the star. I just, it's a very clear place to see the stars. Absolutely. So I can only imagine what it would be like to see that it there. It is pretty shocking. And I mean, to see that, that brought back memories for me. I was actually in Oregon mm. uh, for the 2017 eclipse that came over uh, parts of the states. And really, it was a very deserty area in yeah. this middle of Oregon there. So very similar, but it is a breathtaking experience. To hear those people cheering about it, it brought back all of those feelings. We're cheering on, it's just like a natural <laughs> phenomenon. <laughs> not. It is incredible. Um, all right, but yes, yeah, sadly, no eclipse for Nothing us. Here Nothing like that. Soon. But uh, no, we did have a beautiful time lapse today. And I say beautiful because I wanted to show you that it actually was raining. Because that's right, rain oh. is beautiful. Look at this. Well, we, need it. we needed it to water all of the ground and to water our plants. And uh, yes, it was definitely a stark contrast, as we talked about just a little bit earlier. Canada Day was so lovely, lots of sunshine, basically everything that you could be hoping for at that point in time. But I wanted to give you a recap. We're now getting into July, right? So we want to see maybe how has Vancouver done as a whole over the month of June. And I was comparing the normal average high temperature that we would be getting in June. It's around 19.6 degrees. In actual fact, we could get a little bit warmer than that, 21.1. But the stat that really impressed me, normally in the month of June, we would be getting about 54 millimeters of rain. And we only got 26, so this is exactly why I am cheering that rain. We needed that, and this is going to be great. In terms of what's to be coming for the upcoming 24 hours or so, you're going to notice that we're not going to see a lot of this green, which would be indicating rain all over the place. Instead, it's just going to be a lot more cloud cover, and that's going to be the flavor for the week. So if you like gray, if you like the gray skies, that is definitely what it is going to be. The only place really aside from us uh, that we'll be getting into some of that sunshine is going to be the interior. We've got temperatures into the upper 20s from parts of the south. South Okanagan and this is of course going to relate directly to our fire danger rating which should hopefully still be going down with some of that rain that we did get earlier on into the day. Now in terms of what you can be expecting over the next few days it is worth mentioning that if you are someone who likes the number 21 maybe you're a blackjack player maybe 21 is your favorite number on your jersey this is your week look at that 21 across the board for the next four days overnight lows as well fairly consistent right around 14 15 degrees but you're going to notice that we're not seeing a lot of that yellow sunshine there. I really wish I could, but we kind of got it all out of our system yesterday, so expect a little bit more cloud than sun for this whole upcoming week. I'm disappointed. Uh, no, I try my best, Anita. I really do. Well, there is uh, much warmer weather in France, yes. which is where the World Cup has been played, Women's World Cup, and today mm -hmm. the United States beat England 2-1 to one in a semifinal match at that World Cup. Alex Morgan scored the winning goal in the 31st minute of the match in Lyon, France. American superstar Megan Rapino didn't play in the game and no reason was given for that. She has scored five goals in the tournament. The Americans, who are the defending champs, will play in the final on Sunday against the winner of Sweden and the Netherlands. Coming up after the break, what happened to a man who fell from the wheel well of a plane in London? and why very few stowaways survive.
I'm Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. Your favorite summer tradition is back starting July 5th. Musical Nooners is back for its 10th year. Join us for free concerts weekdays at noon all summer long. And get your tickets today to the Vancouver Folk Music Festival July 19th to 21st at Jericho Beach Park. Enjoy a weekend of the finest folk and roots music from around the world. For more, check us out online. A new poll conducted by CBC found Canadians agree that our country should welcome people who want to immigrate here, but we disagree on who those people should be. Our Cameron McIntosh has more. Ooh, I could take my car. Oh. Three years in Canada. His kids are thriving in English, but Alamayu Bayena still struggles with it. Yet he feels welcome. Very, very friendly people. Nice yes. taking care. Yes, good, good. In the 90s, he good. fled Ethiopia and lived in a refugee camp in Sudan for 25 years before coming here. It surprises him the poll suggests a majority of Canadians don't support having more refugees here. Maybe they don't understand why we came here. When it comes to who should be coming to Canada, opinions are mixed, especially when it comes to refugees. Many Canadians see no distinction between crossing a border to claim asylum with illegal migration. 74% say we should accept immigrants regardless of ethnicity, but only 43% agree we should accept more refugees, while 64% say illegal immigration is a problem. Oh my God, this is a touchy subject. If we're going to keep, uh, how would you say, letting them in, then they're going to overrun us. Canadians aren't alone in these feelings. The global rhetoric over migration and refugees has been on a raging boil. We have to have the wall. If anything, it shows how much we need the wall. I think people have used more and more detrimental and dehumanizing language. Dorota Blumczynska was a child refugee from Poland. Now she helps to settle refugees. She says prejudices are hardening. When we've described people as illegal or when politicians have described refugee claimants as jumping the queue, um, it has really distorted the reality. 54% meanwhile say accepting too many immigrants will change Canada. Your turn, is there? Bayana would yeah. rather the question focus not on where people are coming from, oh God, but know. why they're coming. They don't know the meaning of freedom. Nobody wants to, 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 to be a refuge. Last year, refugees and accepted asylum seekers made up 13% of newcomers to Canada. The rest were mostly skilled workers. 76% of those polled say that's where Canada should focus its immigration efforts. In a country that prides itself on being open, but just not to everyone. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Winnipeg. A post-mortem is pending on the body of a man who fell from the wheel well of a plane in London. The odds were against him from the start. It's likely he froze to death long before he ever hit the ground. As Derek Stoffel reports, very few stowaways survive such a dangerous journey. The flight path to Heathrow Airport is directly over South London. Flight KQ-100 from Nairobi in Kenya on Sunday was captured on a security camera. It's thought a man was concealed in the landing gear compartment of the Boeing 787. The body plummeted about a kilometre from the plane, landing in a backyard belonging to one of those houses just behind me. The stowaway landed here on a concrete path and some astroturf. Witnesses say a man was sunbathing in the backyard only about a meter away from where the corpse landed. One particular neighbor who, as I understand it, saw uh, the remains of this body is obviously quite shocked. Security at some airports in Africa isn't as tight compared to airports in the West, but after 9-11, security checks at Nairobi's airport were increased. Still, as this BBC documentary shows... And he would have had to climb up as quickly as possible along this bit of metal and then into the... Wheel arch. It's not physically difficult to get into the landing gear compartment. Surviving, though, is nearly impossible. On long-haul flights, planes fly at an altitude of more than 11 kilometers, where it can be minus 60 degrees Celsius. So the chance of dying through the cold is, is very great as well. It's a nine-hour flight from Kenya. Uh, it's unlikely they will have survived that, uh, but then the stowaway has to face the fact that the gear is going to come down on approach to land. If they're unconscious, they'll fall out of the undercarriage. When the Kenya plane landed at Heathrow, police found food, water and a bag in the landing gear compartment. British authorities are now trying to identify the stowaway. 
and they're working with officials in Kenya to figure out how the man got on board the plane in the first place. Derek Stoffel, CBC News, London. We're getting disturbing new images and details tonight about the treatment of migrants detained at the southern U.S. border. People crammed into holding pens, held in standing room only conditions for a week, pleading for help. The CBC's Ellen Morrow has more on how it's all hitting home with Americans. Across the U.S. today, outrage on the streets. I cannot bear the fact that children are sleeping on concrete. The new images showing the dire conditions at migrant facilities came in a memo from the Department of Homeland Security's Inspector General, calling on the agency to take immediate steps to alleviate dangerous overcrowding and prolonged detention of children and adults. Border protection agents are on the defensive. Because the entirety of the system is oversaturated, what is happening on the border itself is that we are having to, in CBP, to detain these people longer than, we, than these facilities were ever designed to do. It's not just the facilities, but the culture of Border Patrol facing criticism. An investigation by journalists at ProPublica found a closed Facebook group filled with lewd and cruel posts allegedly written by border agents. It's limited to a number, a very limited number of, of folks who have put that type of rhetoric out there. But from what I can tell you, again, this is not representative of what the U.S. Border Patrol stands for. Latina lawmakers who toured a migrant facility were called scumbuckets, hoes and bitches. Another post questioned whether the heart-wrenching photo of a father and daughter from El Salvador who drowned was real, asking, have y'all ever seen floaters this clean? This is the Texas facility toured by Democratic lawmakers. Women there claimed they didn't have medicine and had been separated from their children. They put them in a room with no running water and these women were being told by CBP officers to drink out of the toilet. Border Protection says it's doing the best it can in the face of a growing crisis. But that's not good enough for the people protesting across the United States, including here in front of the White House tonight. There's no sense, though, that President Trump is hearing them. He has not condemned the Facebook group's posts. Instead, he questioned migrants who claimed asylum, saying most are coming to the United States for purely economic reasons. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, Washington. China is sticking up for the embattled administration in Hong Kong following violent protests over the weekend. Beijing says pro-democracy activists committed serious illegal acts yesterday when they stormed and vandalized the Hong Kong legislature. The UK, which once controlled Hong Kong, is condemning both sides for the unrest. It says China must stick to its commitments it made when it regained control over the city 20 years ago, including the freedom to protest. Workers spent the day clearing up broken glass and garbage at the legislature. Lawmakers are calling it a crime scene. That was the scene yesterday when the protests descended into chaos. Police used tear gas to disperse demonstrators who broke into the legislature. Hong Kong has been dealing with months of major unrest over a controversial extradition bill. Well, hundreds line up as the Stanley Cup goes to small town Alberta. How small? The answer coming up after the break.
Well, hockey's biggest prize has spent the day in a very small place. Callahoo, Alberta is a hamlet which is about 50 kilometers northwest of Edmonton and with a population of less than 100 wow, people. Wow, I didn't know it was that small. <laughs> it's also the birthplace of Craig Ruby, who coached the St. Louis Blues to the Stanley Cup. And today, Rafi Bujikanian was there as he brought the trophy back home. The arena in this tiny hamlet of Callahoo probably hasn't seen this much action in a while. The lineup doesn't even start inside. There are people outside right now, all waiting for a chance to meet the champ and pose with the Stanley Cup. In a place this small, the St. Louis Blues coach is not just a celebrity, he's family. Never grab a touch. <laughs> you can close a couple of times when you're playing, but just when you took over this job, you just don't realize that maybe they were going to make a playoff, maybe. And then all of a sudden this. Uh... For the coach himself, it's a touching homecoming. These people, I know a lot of them, and again, they're just hockey fans, and they love to stand on the cup. It means a lot to them. So for me to bring that cup out here and just let people come in and take some pictures with it and touch it and enjoy it a little bit, it's a good feeling. Now, you may be thinking this is a bit of an intimate venue for something like the Stanley Cup. And you'd be right. Organizers said they did not want to kick up too much of a fuss about it, adding if Edmonton Oilers fans want to see the trophy, let their own team win the cup. Rafi Bujikani, CBC News, Callahoo, Alberta. I mean, that's probably some of the most action that town's seen in a long time. I would have to bet so. 85 people live in that town. Wow. 85. Tiny. <laughs> All right, well, you've probably heard the expression, music soothes the savage mm -hmm. beast. So that means it's got to work for cows too, right? Well, that seems to be the opinion of a veterinarian based on the southern coast of England. <laughs> Wow, Alfonso Camasa serenades the cows with classical opera. He's been singing to farm animals since his childhood in Italy, and he takes opera singing lessons regularly. He hasn't said how long he plans to continue, but it seems to work, so he may be singing very well until the cows come home. <laughs> good, ah. good one, Brad. Yeah, I had to put that in there, just, just one pun, come on. That's amazing. I mean, why not? It, it, I think it works for a lot of animals. Plants, too. See? Exactly. Yeah. It's really cool how that works. <laughs> All right, that is it for our program tonight. Thanks so much for joining us. Dan will be here with your next local news at 11 o'clock. Have a good night. Have a good one.